My name is Jeanette Pesciatelli, and I'm the Guest Experience and Engagement Manager from the Peggy Notabar Nature Museum. This lecture is presented in partnership between the Chicago Ornithological Society, the Chicago Audubon Society, and the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum as a part of our Compelling Voices in Birding lecture series. This special series features unique speakers with very different backgrounds and experiences in the birding community. We had originally planned to have this as an in-person event at the Peggy Notabart Nature Museum, but we are thrilled to be able to be virtually with you all today and still be able to feature our uh, wonderful speaker tonight. Dr. Lori Goodrich is joining us from the Hawk Mountain Sanctuary in Eastern Pennsylvania. Dr. Goodrich began at the institution 30 years ago as their first full-time researcher on staff. She is now their Director of Conservation Science, overseeing all programs, staff, facilities, of the Conservation Science Department. Founded in 1934, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary is now a leading center of raptor conservation science, education, monitoring, and stewardship, and continues to engage people locally as well as globally, no doubt with the help of Dr. Lori Goodrich's passion and leadership. So before I turn it over to Dr. Goodrich, I'd like to again um, encourage everyone to please put questions in the chat box as you have them, and hopefully we'll be able to address most of them at the end after Dr. Goodrich is done presenting. So without further ado, I'm going to pass it off to Dr. Lori Goodrich. Thank you so much. Well, hi, everybody. It's great to be with you. Sorry I couldn't be that person. Um, so let me get started. You can see my screen okay? Okay, all right. Uh, I have a lot to cover in a, it's just a couple minutes or less than an hour, so I'm gonna get, to get rolling here. But I'm gonna talk to you today a little bit about Hawk Mountain the Place, but also about the migration science that has been uh, going on for over 85 years. Um, One of the things I would like to leave with you, leave you with today is uh, actually a message of hope. Uh, I know these are tough times for a lot of people, but Hawk Mountain, the story of Hawk Mountain is really a, a inspirational story in how people can really make a few people or even just one person can make a big difference in uh, the history of conservation. So uh, just keep that in mind as we move forward. Um, specifically, I'm gonna talk today about Hawk Mountain, the place, the organization and talk about the integral role of education in our conservation history, uh, the history of the sanctuary itself. And then I'm gonna talk mostly about uh, migration science and how the count, the 85 years of migration counts have informed our understanding of uh, migration ecology of raptors. We'll touch on a little bit of the trends and happy to talk about that more. Uh, and then just a little bit about how we're, we're studying migration ecology today at Hawk Mountain. By the way, this is a, a panoramic view of the top of Hawk Mountain. I hope some of you have been there, been to Hawk Mountain and perhaps some of you are members, but if you haven't been there, maybe this will inspire you to come visit in the future. Where is Hawk Mountain? Well, we're located east of you. Uh, we're about two and a half hours in DC and not that far really from Philadelphia. So you could easily get on an airplane uh, once this COVID thing's gone and uh, join us at the Hawk Mountain for a day or two. Geographically, the Hawk Mountain is located within the central Appalachian topography or within this series of ridges that run all the way from Maine down to Georgia. And this is actually the view looking north from Hawk Mountain. But the sanctuary itself is located on the southernmost ridge of the Appalachian mountain chain, which is known as the Kittatinny Ridge, which is a word meaning endless mountain in the Lene Lenape language. And this, this uh, ridge is designated an important bird area in ex extent all the way from northern New Jersey into Maryland. And it's very continuous ridge uh, and very critical important uh, bird corridor for birds migrating in the fall. If you take a look at the Kittatinny Ridge, and this is actually a view looking as a hawk might look as it approaches Hawk Mountain. Here's the North Lookout where we conduct our migration counts. You can see it's a very precipitous ridge. It has about a thousand foot drop, vertical drop to the valley floor below. And uh, 
it's a very prominent ridge. And in the satellite view, you can see the arrows are pointing out this very prominent ridge that you can see even from the satellite view. So it's an incredibly prominent uh, landmark on the landscape. But for the migrating raptors, it has a very important function. It serves as what we call a leading line. And the birds, as they're moving south out of the north and heading south for the, for the winter, uh, hit this ridge and then they follow it for different periods of time, sometimes following it for the entire extent of the st state of Pennsylvania. And why are they following this ridge? Well, they're following it because of these amazing wind currents that are created along this very vertical slope. So when we have a windy day, we get very strong updrafts, as you can see here on the left. And the updraft, the wind hits the mountain, is deflected upward, and it creates this wave of air that the birds can get their body in and just glide almost like a torpedo down the ridge, saving a lot of energy along the way. And the other wind current is created on non-windy days is called a thermal. And that's created along the south facing slope of the mountain. Well, if you remember that mountain has a very long corridor of south facing slopes and those, that slope creates a whole line of thermals that birds can use, raptors can use to circle up and save energy on their way south. So that's a little bit about the place of Hawk Mountain and why it's important to birds. Uh, let me just mention a little bit about the organization. Hawk Mountain was founded in 1934 as a private nonprofit organization. We're not affiliated with federal or state governments or any other nonprofit agency. And we were the first sanctuary in the world to be set aside to protect birds of prey. We're currently staffed with 18 full-time staff where we use volunteers a lot to do our work. And uh, we also are uh, working collaboratively with trainees in all seasons of the year. Our mission is to conserve birds of prey worldwide by providing leadership and rafter in the sanctuary itself as a model facility. We do this through programs in three areas, conservation education, which includes the outreach to the public, land stewardship and conservation. We have 2,500 acres of land that we protect and we manage to, uh, for Appalachian wildlife and conservation science. And today I'm really mostly gonna be talking about the science at Hawk Mountain. So let's just start, start with a few statistics about Hawk Mountain. Uh, again, standing on North Lookout, we have 2,500 acres of land. Most of that has been protected with a conservation easement to the Nature Conservancy. We have eight miles of hiking trails. So if you come, we're open year round for hikers and bird watchers and we're protected or insulated by 15,000 acres of, of protected land. We, we count uh, about 20,000 raptors each fall season flying down the ridge past the sanctuary. But what a lot of people don't know is that we're also counting just about everything else that flies by the mountain. So we record on average about 65,000 other birds and monarch butterflies and dragonflies as well. And most importantly, where, where do we get our support? We have 9,500 members from throughout the country and actually globally, and memberships are key. They're really the lifeblood to keeping Hawk Mountain's raptor conservation going. So if anyone's interested at the end of the program, please do check out our website. And we have visitors. As I said, we're open year round to visitors. If you're not a member, you pay a trail fee, and that helps us keep the trails open and manage for, vis for visitation. And in this new virtual world, we're getting a lot of visitation on our website and on our virtual programs. And we tally about almost 300,000 visitors to our, our web uh, education. So let me talk a little bit about the history of Hawk Mountain. And really, this is where um, the power of the individual, I think, really steps forward. Hawk Mountain was founded by Rosalie Edge. She was uh, a New York City woman um, had been active in the early 1900s in the suffragette movement to win the right, right to vote. So she had a little bit of knowledge about how to get people to change their minds about things. And she had become a bird watcher and she was birding in Central Park with other bird watchers. And she had recently started a new organization called the Emergency Conservation Committee, which um, worked to uh, conduct conservation activities. They produce pamphlets 
And she was very active in forest conservation. And actually, a lot of her work led to the protection of some na major national parks out west. And I would just refer you to this book here. If you're interested in the history of Rosalie Edge, this is the biography uh, written by Diana, Diana Fermancy. It's a very good book, um, and it's available, I'm sure. So Rosalie um, was a member of the Audubon Society, and she went to a meeting of the National Audubon Society in New York City and sat during a presentation where this photograph here of all these dead hawks and several other photographs similar were presented to the audience. And that these photographs were taken by several young men from Philadelphia who had heard about this place where people could shoot hawks along the ridges of, of Pennsylvania and went up there and saw all this devastation and all these dead bodies and dying hawks and decided to collect them and take some photographs. So they took these photographs to the meeting of the Audubon societies in New York City, hoping to win some, some urgency and some conservation action towards trying to protect these hawks that were being slaughtered. Well, at that time, the Audubon Society was really more interested in songbird conservation and, and really nothing was done that day. So Rosalie wrote in her diary that uh, she paced the floor trying to, thinking about this and being really um, upset that nothing was gonna be done about these hawk shooting that was going on in Pennsylvania. And she decided that if something was going to happen, it was going to have to be her that made that, made that uh, step. So she got in a car with her son, Peter, and drove out to uh, Hawk Mountain to try to see if there was something that could be done. It was in the spring of 1934, I believe. And uh, at that time, she, she discovered that the sanctuary property where the, where the shooting was taking place was actually up for sale. So she put down money. On, with, with an, on a, to lease the mountain with an option to buy, borrowing from friends to do so. And in so doing, she, she actually started the first sanctuary in the world for, for raptors. But of course, she was not the person to stand at the mountaintop and tell people that they couldn't, could no longer shoot the spruin, who had met years ago in Central Park, and contacted him um, at his job up in New England and said, can you come down and help? And she wrote in her letter that I hope that I can get immediate possession and stop the slaughter of hawks this autumn. There has never been a hawk sanctuary. And Maurice um, agreed to this immediately uh, and accepted um, an agreement to have no salary, but just have his expenses paid for him and his wife to, to work on the mountain that fall. So he arrived at Hawk Mountain on September 10th. And by September 12th, he was patrolling the uh, the mountaintop uh, to keep people from shooting the hawks. And he mentions that he saw 50 hawks go over. Well, sometime between September 12th and September 30th, he decided that his time was better set, spent at the top of the mountain counting the hawks. So he left his wife, Irma, down by the gate to talk to the visitors as they came in so he could keep the count at the lookout. And that actually was a very significant point because he actually started the first raptor scientifically uh, recording, recorded migration count anywhere in the world. So in 1934, September 1934, the first sanctuary for raptors was established. It was 1400 acres. Uh, there was a mission charged on weekends, but uh, in general, people were allowed to come up. They would just have to leave their guns at the gate if they brought them with them. And, and take binoculars instead. In the early history of the sanctuary, much of the focus was on stopping the shooting because even though Hawk Mountain was protected, there was still shooting going on all up and down the ridge at other locations. So the board of directors and staff early on were really focused on winning protection for these raptors all throughout the journey along this mountain range. Well, how did they do that? From the 1930s through the 1950s, there was a real focus on education and outreach and trying to get the public engaged in understanding why raptors were important in the environment and why they should be protected from shooting. Uh, and this was an activity that was undertaken not only by the staff, which would be Maurice Brune at this point and his wife Irma, but also by the board of directors. Over here on the, on the side of your screen, you see uh, one of the board members in those days was Roger Torrey Peterson. He's here talking with Reese at the lookout. But I wanted to show this photograph of the lookout scene because this is a photograph from 1936. So only two years after 
the founding of the sanctuary, 750 people were registered in one day to coming up from all places, usually from Philadelphia, but other places to see this great spectacle. So obviously the word had gotten out from Rosalie's efforts and all other people's efforts that raptors could be seen at this lookout. So over the years, um, there was a lot of effort to win legal protection for raptors and the, the, the fight um, through education was expanding and more and more people were learning about raptors and, and joining the, the, uh, the battle to try to protect raptors. But it wasn't until 1966 when the Pennsylvania Model Hawk Law was enacted that we really saw some, some teeth to the law protecting raptors. And it wasn't until 1972 when the Migratory Bird Treaty Act that, Act was passed that federally that all the raptors were protected throughout their life cycle and throughout um, the continent. Unfortunately, Rosalie uh, passed away in the early 1960s. So she, would, she did not live to see this legal protection take place, but she did li live to see the Hawk Mountain become a great success re recognized throughout the country. So education right from the beginning was key to, to Hawk Mountain's conservation efforts. And how, do we, how does this happen? Well, if you've been to a Hawk Watch site somewhere, you, I think you know already how, how exciting and inspirational it can be to see raptors in migration. And Hawk Mountain is this ideal location. You sit on top of this mountain and you often are looking down at the raptors. You can see them coming from miles away. And it's, really, um, it's a really special experience. And so we have used that experience to connect people to raptors over the years, and we're doing that today. So even if it's a common bird like this red-tailed hawk that you see sailing by, to be able to, uh, for somebody who's never seen a bird of prey in the wild, to be able to see a site like this, it really can change their day and maybe change, hopefully change their mind about conservation. We call this a school in the clouds and uh, we are um, continuing our efforts with school in the clouds daily up here. We have, when we're not uh, dealing with pandemic, we have visiting school groups every day in the spring and the fall. And of course, families are coming to visit. As I said, we get about 75,000 visitors a year. In addition, we've, we've been launching into the virtual program realm and uh, there's all kinds of programs being given now from around the globe actually with uh, people that have been working with us as trainees or research associates. So I invite you to visit our, our YouTube channel and our website to see some of that offering. One of our most important con raptor conservation outreach programs that we have today is our international trainee program or international intern program. We have uh, hosted since the 1970s, 450 young folks to Hawk Mountain for three to four months at a time from 75 countries. And interestingly enough, 60% of them are women. So I'm guessing Rosalie would be proud of us. Um, and this program has been very important because we've trained every, each individual in raptor science, raptor education. They, they do every single individual learns how to talk to the public, how to talk to them about the basics of raptor biology, and also how to identify raptors and how to conduct migration counts. So many of them go back to their own countries and start uh, their own raptor conservation efforts around the world. Well, let's turn our attention to the raptor count itself. Remember, we had Maurice Bruin up on the lookout as early as September of 1934, starting this scientifically uh, valid migration count, very consistent. He recorded, right from the get-go, he recorded things like temperature, wind direction, wind speed, the hours that he was at the lookout in his journal. And that data has been a, an incredible resource and we, to understanding raptor populations and raptor migration over the years. We have the longest running record of migration counts, as you can imagine, anywhere in the world. So it's a real resource to scientists and students of migration. Uh, the, the consistency of the count has been maintained over the years. Maurice made sure that if he was not able to be at the lookout in those early years, that one of his volunteers was up there counting the hawks and recording the data. And today we maintain pretty much the same method as, as, my, as Maurice did. We've maybe shifted our where we count a couple of rocks up, but uh, the view is about the same and uh, the methods are about the same. Our optics might be a little better. And recently we started using tablet computers to record the data. 
but really the consistency of the data effort has been fairly high. So just a few statistics for you about the migration count. As I said, we record about 20,000 raptors of 16 species uh, each year. And on average, we've seen about two to 300 hawks per day. Uh, our biggest flight on average is usually about 3,000 birds, and it's usually when the broadwing hawks come through. But there was a miracle day, we call it, back in September 14th, 1978, when 21,000 hawks flew over Hawk Mountain. And that, uh, we haven't surpassed that yet since. Out of Hawk Mountain, around the migration, I think it's important to to keep in mind um, this quote that we often use at Hawk Mountain that Rosalie Edge penned early on, which was the time to protect a species is while it's still common. And this was her argument for why we need to monitor these raptors and keep a tabs on them. Even if there are, you know, 4,000 sharp shins counted a year, we need to keep tabs of them so that we can detect a decline before it gets too late. And one of the, um, the first scientific papers that came out of Hawk Mountain was written by Maurice, published in the AUK, and it was just a report of the 1934 migration count. Nothing too exciting, 10,000 raptors. But one of the things that he recorded was 39 golden eagles. And at that time in the 1930s, there were no golden eagles recognized to exist in the eastern United States. So many ornithologists saw this report and thought, well, he must be misidentifying bald eagles as golden eagles. So they went up there the following fall season, and lo and behold, Maurice showed them several golden eagles passing over. And this was actually the first recognized data on golden eagle, gold, golden eagle population existing in Eastern North America. And soon thereafter, or decades later, it was discovered that there are nesting golden eagles in Quebec and Labrador that are migrating down these Appalachian Mountains. It's a critical corridor for this population and one of the best places to see golden eagles in the Eastern US. Another interesting study that Maurice participated in or, or launched was to measure how fast the birds were going. You would get that question at the lookout, how fast are these birds flying? So uh, being an uh, ingenious uh, person, he, he strung a phone line from the top of Hawk Mountain, east along the mountaintop, several miles, and had a friend of his stand out there and tell him when certain birds were coming by, he was able to record the migration speed. And I don't know if you can see this down here, but the migration speed of those birds ranged between 26 to 40 miles per hour. Now, this is probably a little faster than they're flying along uh, generally, because you have to keep in mind that these birds are using that wind current to give them a little extra boost as they fly along Hawk Mountain. In the 1950s, Maurice published another important paper that is now uh, well overlooked, but um, it was the first report on how weather conditions uh, may concentrate hawk migration. And nowadays, as bird watchers, you all know that when a cold front comes through, that's when you want to go out looking for warblers or raptors or anything else. But Maurice was really the first one to publish a paper describing what conditions concentrate raptor migration. So since the 1930s, uh, in 1934, if you went looking to watch hawks, you would have found just Hawk Mountain. But since then, of course, there are, the number of sites has grown exponentially. And we now have hundreds of sites, well, at least 100 sites across North America and into Mexico and Central America where we can go to watch hawks. But I would argue that every single one of those sites can trace their ancestry back to Hawk Mountain because people would come into Hawk Mountain in those early days, but then we'd go back and they'd say, well, I wonder if there's a place I can watch hawks where I live. And that's how a lot of these hawk watches got started, where they heard about uh, this place and they, they learned about how to count hawks um, and then they found their own, own site. An additional, another um, key uh, help for Hawk Mountain was it published the first field guide to raptors in flight. Uh, and there really were, there were no field guides that really displayed raptors uh, in, in their flight uh, display uh, and how they held their wings until 1973 when this book came out. And if you can find this in the used book aisle, I highly recommend that you pick it up. But if you go looking for raptor field guides today, you might have six, seven, eight different versions. There's an app out there that you can buy as well. 
Um, but th back in the 70s, this was all there was, and it was a highly sought after publication. Up Mountain was also one of the first to set up standardized protocols for conducting counts and developing you know, um, instructions and data forms. And uh, in the 1970s, we worked with others to form this new nonprofit called the Hawk Migration Association, which oversees now all hawk count sites across North America and, um, and oversees the, the website where all the data are collected called hawkcount.org. Well, some of the data that Hawk Mountain um, has, was collecting over the years started to take, uh, started to be used in about the 1950s by people outside of Hawk Mountain. And Maurice Brune, one of the, one of the examples of this would be in the 1950s, Maurice Brune was, wrote twice in the newsletter to Hawk Mountain members that he was concerned about bald eagle populations. He was noticing that the numbers of bald eagles were declining each year, but more importantly, that the proportion of young birds had declined. And the data looks something like this. So we see the eagle count here uh, in the 1940s was pretty high, 1950s, and then just seemed to go crashing down through the 1960s. And the proportion of juveniles to adults was crashing at the same time. Well, this woman here, uh, Rachel Carson, was a member at the time and a biologist who came up to the sanctuary from her job in D Washington, D.C. to watch hawks and became friends with, hawk, with uh, Maurice Brune. And she asked Maurice if she could use our data, the bald eagle data, as part of her evidence of what uh, DDT might be doing to the bird populations. So if you go to read this book that was published in 1962, you'll see there's about two pages devoted to Hawk Mountain bald eagle counts. So that was really the first significant use of our migration data for uh, evidence of trends in populations. But the best, uh, the, really the key scientific publication occurred in 1990 when uh, we published an article in the AUC on how, on how pop migration counts really are tracking uh, known population trends. And we used this known decline in eagles and other birds due to DDT as evidence that the migration counts were indeed tracking uh, real population trends, as we can see here in the eagle numbers dropping. In early 1990s, we um, hosted one of our interns from Mexico, Ernesto Morales, and he invited us to collaborate in the first migration count in East, in Mexico. And he, he had been seeing a lot of migration in the area that he lived and he wanted to conduct a migration count just like he had seen at Hawk Mountain. So we collaborated both with him and with Hawk Watch International to send some folks from here down to help him get started um, they set up four count sites across this region in the circle here, where the mountains are converging on the coastline in eastern Mexico. And within the first two seasons, they had recorded over two million raptors. And as their count, count methods perfected, they were recording over four million raptors each season of 30 different species, and an estimated 95% of the world's population of broadwing hawks, Swainson's hawks, and Mississippi kites and many Western turkey vultures as well. So this site is now known as the world's, uh, the global hotspot or global highest count of raptors, migratory raptors anywhere in the world. And they continue today uh, modeling their programs after Hawk Mountain. They have uh, uh, with our help, they have, uh, have uh, developed education programs, which are, uh, they work with the school kids as well as the public. And over the years, we've hosted at least 10 different trainees that have come through our science or education programs and gone back to help down in Veracruz. And most significantly, they're also starting some land conservation efforts down there. Well, Hawk Mountain has had um, influence in other areas of the globe as well. We published a, 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 a directory of raptor migration flyways that is available as a book. And we also launched in the 2000s, the Hawks Aloft worldwide effort to try to promote uh, raptor migration counts and conservation around the world. So we produced this manual, it's also available in Spanish. Uh, and just to show a little bit of Hawk Mountain's uh, reach, in 1991 was the start of the, the Veracruz River Raptors in Mexico, 
In 2004, one of our trainees some, uh, started a migration count in Bolivia. In 2005, there was a several year count in Costa Rica. In 2000, there was a, a major uh, ocean to ocean count it was called in Panama, which now is continued today by Audubon, Audubon Panama. And just last, um, last uh, this past spring, we collaborated with one of our in trainees to conduct a, a scientific migration count in Colombia, which she's hoping to continue next year. And some of our trainees have also started counts in Batumi, Georgia, uh, Thailand, and Nepal. So our reach is really um, global, and we're using this Hawk Mountain model um, by training these young folks and sending them back. We do offer some small grants for them after they leave as well. Turning our attention back to North America here at the mountain, um, the, one of the things we realized early on is that we can't monitor population trends for a, a continent by just counting hawks at one place. So in 2004, we started another collaboration called the Raptor Population Index Project, where we're collaborating with the Hawk Migration Association, Hawkwatch International, and Bird Studies Canada through something we call the RPI Project. And the focus of that is to, is to synthesize population trends for raptors on a, on a uh, North American scale. Uh, in 2008, we published this, pre, this book, which summarizes the trends from 22 sites. But um, in the next couple of weeks, we're going to have an update on the RPI website that'll, that'll include trends from, uh, I believe it's going to be 75 different sites. So it's going to be a very important look at how raptors are doing. Let's take a little bit, a look at some of this long-term data and what it looks like. Uh, in this graph here, the blue line just shows the trend. Each little dot is the um, annual count. Uh, and then the, the line you can just ignore, it's an estimate of the variation uh, across days. But what you can see here, this American kestrel trend. And we're very concerned about American kestrels. We're launching some new research on them because they've been undergoing this long-term decline starting about the year 2000 to present day. And we can see that they rebounded during the DD, after the DDT era was over, but uh, since then, we're, in recent years, we're seeing some concern. And if we look, if we look at uh, how uh, other sites are showing the trends from other sites, other migration watch sites, you can see that uh, most of this decline is occurring in the eastern corridor and maybe perhaps the Great Lakes, but not so much out west. So this is a little clue that we can follow up on on trying to track down what's going on with American kestrel populations. But it's really, um, the decline is really precipitous in some areas. In New Jersey and Delaware, they're already listed as species of special concern. So for a once common bird, it's one we want to take a look at. And perhaps um, we get a little bit of an inkling of what might be going on if we look at another grassland nesting birds, kestrels nest in grasslands and northern harriers nest in grasslands. And we see a fairly similar pattern with a number of eastern sites showing uh, significant declines. And you can see Hawk Mountains counts have really dropped off in recent years. Now, there may be two factors going on here. We see three green arrows up in the Canadian region. And that might suggest that some birds might not be migrating as far as they used to, which we're seeing with some of our birds at Hawk Mountain, some of our uh, hardy migrants like the red-tailed hawk are just staying farther north. So when we, they're not really declining, but we're seeing less of them at the lookout. But I think with a harrier, it's probably both that climate change impact as well as possibly something more insidious. So good news, there's always good news to talk about. Um, bald eagles, we're seeing lots and lots more bald eagles. And what's interesting is to look at the data from 1930s to present day, you could see that bald eagles are much more numerous now than they ever were within the history of Hawk Mountain. And that kind of makes sense when you figure that back in the 30s and 40s, they were getting shot quite a lot. And then they got hammered by DDT. So it's really only now that they're probably coming back to their historic level. And it'll be interesting to see at what point they start to level out. We're seeing similar increases in golden eagle, merlins, and peregrine falcons as well. So there are some good news in our counts. And I did mention early on that we count other things flying by the lookout. We have not done as good a job of analyzing those data, so we're starting to do that now. But just as an example, here's 
a small migrant that passes by uh, regularly, particularly toward the uh, end of August and early September. And you can see that their numbers over time have really increased, although maybe slight decline in recent years. Uh, one bird that seems to be coming by, or at least we're seeing them less, and I don't know if it's a migration pattern change or something in their populations, is the common loon. We're seeing less and less common loons flying over the lookout. But all these data we're hoping to analyze in the next year or two and, and get out there for people to, to uh, see what's going on. Uh, we've also done some research on migration of hummingbirds. Um, this is a recent paper that one of our trainees published along the staff, looking at how possibly the climate change might be impacting the timing of migration for some birds. And what we can see here is perhaps um, not intuitive, but is what this graph shows is the, the timing of their passage rate. And we can see that the, that the timing is getting earlier. So on the left side here is the date, and uh, this is the year on the bottom. We can see as years go by, they're migrating earlier and earlier. And what we don't know is whether this is complemented in the spring, because we don't have good data on that yet. So let's um, let to end my talk with talking about a little bit about our research and how we're studying migration ecology today. We're continuing our migration counts, doing things just like we were, but we're also trying to, to understand the migration threats and the conservation needs of these raptors more, more in depth. And we know that migration is a risky period of life for most birds. Uh, studies on songbirds have suggested that most mortality occurs during migration. So if a bird arrives on its breeding grounds or arrives on its wintering grounds, usually they, they survive that period. But it's during the migration when there's so many threats that they can encounter and unknown things that we tend to lose birds. So we wanted to use this new technology of telemetry to track migrations day by day during their migration and understand what, uh, what their needs are and what their threats are. So I'm going to talk about three studies um, here. I don't have time to talk about all our research, but this is a study of uh, two of our forest hawks. That we, we used uh, standard telemetry, VHF telemetry, to track these birds on their migration. And one of the things we wanted to look at was whether they were stopping to rest and feed on their migration south and how often they were and what kinds of habitats they were using. We might have predicted that they would that sh that they would just sit down anywhere. Both of these birds are known to hang out at bir bird feeders, so maybe they just hang out in suburban neighborhoods when they're migrating south. We really didn't know. So this is what our data looks like. These are tracks of about 45 different birds, sharpshins on the left and coopers on the right. And you can see we followed some as far south as North Carolina. Um, we followed them for on average three to seven days. Um, some of them were lost right away, and some of them followed the, the mountain all the way down, but others didn't. And so let's look at this chart here. One of the questions was, are, they, are birds migrating every day during their migration period? And each line here is a different bird, and the days that we track them are on the top. And what you can see is with the, the yellow M represents days the birds spent at least some part of the day migrating and the little end is a day they didn't migrate. So what you, you hope you can see right away is no, they're not migrating every day. In fact, they're spending as much time, if not more time, if you look down here at Cooper's Hawk One, he migrated for two days, rested for three days, migrated for two days, rested for three days. So he was actually spending more time resting and feeding than he was in migration. And that makes sense because migration is an is energy consumptive activity. So they should need to replenish their stores. And these birds don't build up a lot of fat, uh, unlike the songbirds. In addition, if we look at what the birds were doing during the day, we don't know for sure that they were foraging, but the activity monitor on the transmitter suggested that they were, they were moving around as if they were foraging. So we called it foraging. And then roosting was when they are sitting still. But the important thing here is that both on days they were migrating, as you can see in blue, and days they were not migrating, they were spending significant proportion of their daylight hour, between 30 and 40 percent, in foraging type activity. So obviously, having places to hunt and to rest and feed was important to these birds. And what we found as far as habitat is that both Sharpshin hawks and Cooper's hawks roosted, uh, went down and stopped in large unbroken 
forest. They were not sitting down in suburban areas. They were seeking out the largest track of wood they could find along that migration route. So that take home message to me is that habitat along migration routes is incredibly important and we need to be protecting it, not, uh, not only for the raptors, but all, all birds. Satellite telemetry has been an important tool in our study of migration. Um, I'll just talk about two studies where we've used satellites um, to track migrating raptors. The first one is um, a study that we were conducting on one of our most numerous migrants, the broadwing hawk. And the broadwing hawk is a, also a forest nesting bird that breeds throughout central United States, eastern United States, and winters in completely different area in central and South America. And one of the reasons we wanted to look at them is if you look over here, you see all this red, is that in the, the 2008 publication that we put out, we found that uh, a good proportion of the hawk watch trends that we were seeing suggested that broadwing hawks might be declining in some parts of their range. So we started re studying these birds both on their nesting grounds as well as on their wintry grounds and their, and their migration using these telemetry units. And what we found is that individuals are very site faithful. They return every year to both their nesting territory and their wintry territory. And uh, we were able to understand better their migration patterns. So this is a map, this map here shows migration routes for female broadwing hawks from Pennsylvania only. And you can see that they're following this Appalachian mountain chain down. They go through Mexico or Central America and then they end up down in uh, South America, at least the, the adults do. And what we've found is the, that of the nine adults that we tagged, almost all of them ended up in South America, whereas the three juveniles that we tracked ended up wintering in Central America. So the juveniles appear at this time, although very small sample size, to have a shorter migration. In addition, uh, this long distance migrant broadwing hawks also spent a notable amount of time in what we call stopover. And stopover we defined mm -hmm. as a place where they spent at least 24 hours of, of uh, time. So we found of, of the nine, um, of, the, of the 12 birds that we tagged, they were stopping over in their migration or spending more than 24 hours in one place on anywhere from one to 12 times during that migration for up to at least two to five days on average. So that was important because that also indicates that stopping to rest and feed is important. And when we look at the telemetry tracks of those birds on stopover, you can see they're moving around, they're, um, they're using the forest and obviously doing something. And I would suggest they're probably looking for food to replenish their fuel. And the last thing I wanna mention from this study is that, um, that uh, three of our birds wintered in southern Peru within 150 kilometers of each other, which was kind of interesting. So what we're doing now with this study is trying to get uh, tags on birds from different areas, not from Pennsylvania, but from Canada, New Hampshire, and other parts of the range to understand if they might winter in different areas. And the last thing I want to mention here is um, our studies with scavengers. And uh, we've been studying scavengers throughout North America by conducting roadside surveys as well as um, doing uh, satellite telemetry. And one of the reasons is that scavengers have been plummeting in numbers in Asia and Africa. So we wanted to get, get in on the ground floor while our vultures are still calm and to try to understand their population change. And I'll just uh, mention one thing about the vultures and that is we've seen very high faithfulness to their migration routes and to where they winter. And different populations also show different places uh, wintering in different places. For example, the Saskatchewan tag birds all wintered in Northern South America. I'm gonna end there and just say that we have lots of conservation science research going on at Hawk Mountains, snowy owls, American kestrels. We're working with colleagues in Africa, but I really don't have time to talk about all that. And so I'd like to turn it over to questions. Okay, let's look at the questions. We had a, just not that many. Um, let's see. Okay, this is sort of a directions question from Alan Kay. Um, approximately how long is the drive from the base of the mountain up to the parking lot time-wise? And then how long is the walk to the, walk, to the watch area time-wise? 
Um, yeah, we have our visitor center is actually um, on at the hilltop of the mountain, and uh, the trails from there about one mile to the top of the mountain is about thirty minute walk. But there is a lookout closer to the road that uh, is only about a five minute walk and is actually wheelchair accessible as well and stroller accessible. So um, it's very easy to get to the first lookout. We call our south lookout. And then it's about a mile farther to the top of the mountain. Great. OK, thanks. Um, here's here's one on that great hawk, walk, hawk watching day that you had in 1974 or 78. Do they have any idea of why they had so many hawks on that one single miracle day? Um, yeah, I, I, it, has, it has something to do with the weather. Um, there was, um, we believe that there was a, a very strong easterly flow of wind off to the east, bringing birds from the east towards the mountains. And we've seen in the past, recent years that whenever we get um, like a, a tropical depression off the coast of New Jersey that kind of circles all that air towards us that we can get a big pulse of migration. But yeah, it's hard to, hard to predict. Yeah, right. Okay, thank you. Um, I think An Antonio answered this for us. What is a good starter binoculars for neophytes? And there, he put on the chat a YouTube video that people might want to take a look at if you're interested in getting binoculars and you're not and you're new to birding. So take a look at that on the chat. Um, let's see. So thanks. Okay, here's a, here are a couple other substantive ones. How concerning is Trump's backtracking of bird protections? Do you think there is a good chance our next of our next president undoing this damage? Uh, well, I would I would hope that. Um, damages can be undone. Um, you know, I hope the Migratory Bird Treaty Act stays strong, and mm -hmm. uh, it is concerning that um, that take is under question for being um, allowed at certain levels. Uh, it, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act has worked very well since 1972 mm -hmm. to present. It really doesn't need to be tampered with. Um, there's been there's a lot of efforts from the federal government to work with businesses to uh, to reach. Um, to reach agreements as to when they need to do things and have to take uh, nests or whatever. So um, I just hope it has, ha it doesn't get changed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. I think <laughs> as, as all of us do too. Um, is, would Lori uh, like to mention a couple of the best hawk watching sites in Costa Rica? <laughs> <laughs> um, is that something you're familiar with? Yeah. Um, yeah, I've, I've been to Costa Rica hawk watching. Actually, the entire country can be good for hawk watching. Mm -hmm. But um, the one site that we helped found was Kekeldi, which is, uh, I believe, on the um, east side. Uh, I could be wrong about that. But it's it's um, not that far from the coast. And uh, anywhere along that that side, um, that slope in, this, in the spring can be excellent for hawk watching. Okay, thanks. I'm supposed to go there one of these days. <laughs> the trip got canceled in March. So, um, can you explain the difference in Hawk Watch mission to migration studies on a conservation site such as Hawk Mount Mountain? I'm not sure that's totally clear. Um, you mean so maybe if if Ann Beeler, the questioner, would like to rephrase that, that would be helpful. If if it's comparing the Hawk Migration Association and Hawk Mountain, is that the question? I guess. Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah, that's the question. So we, we work. Oh, go ahead, Ann. Sorry. No, that's the question. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, yeah, we work closely with the Hawk Migration Association and support them. I um, actually serve on the board of directors myself. Um, and, you know, their mission is really to oversee all the hawk watch sites in North America. And actually, they're working now into Central America as well. And really to collaborate, <laughs> bring that data together and really serve the, the uh, hawk watcher uh, through their mission. Whereas Hawk Mountain is really focused on this global raptor conservation mission. So we collaborate them with them on deriving trends for North American raptors. But, um, but our work is really working um, both in science and education, but also at a global level. Okay, great. 
Let's see. Um, here, here's another one from the last map Lori just showed. It looks like some vultures crossed the Gulf of Mexico in their southern migration. Is, is that true? Is that correct? Um, no, I think there was an arrow maybe that crossed okay. across, but no, they're, they're very much a soaring migrant. So they stay on land where they can get those nice mm -hmm. thermals or near land. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, uh, if, as in one of the reasons Veracruz River Raptors is such a, a concentrated place is because all these soaring birds don't want to cross that Gulf of Mexico. So right. they're being funneled down through, between the mountains and the coast. Right. True. Um, so is the Hawk Mountain book still available for purchase? I think that one that you showed us, you said is you'd be lucky to find in a bookstore, in a used bookstore, perhaps. I'm not sure. Yeah, we have a new book called The Hawk Mountain Story that's available. Um, and a lot of we do have a small store on our website if people are interested in looking. But that Feathers in the Wind book is uh, out of print and has been out of print for a long time. But it's it's really um, well, if you're a hawk watcher, it's definitely a collectible. Right, right. It's kind of Good. rudimentary for the... <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Um, what is the prog prognosis for protecting raptors on their wintering grounds? Uh, you know, I have some deep concerns there about what's going on in South America currently and yeah. in Central America. Um, but there's always... There's some great work going on with National Audubon Society and Nature Conservancy to try to bring attention to these areas. So there's a lot of hope. And uh, I was just in Colombia last fall, and uh, there's a huge surge in bird watching in that country. So there is a lot to be hopeful for. But my concerns are in how fast areas like Brazil and other areas are getting burned and cut over so fast. And at least two of our broadwing hawks flew down into areas south of the Amazon in Brazil and turned around um, and went back. And if, when you look at where they were going, it had all been recently cut over in, for agriculture. So obviously I'm making a connection here that I don't really know. I don't right. really know what happened there, but um, it is concerning. Yeah, certainly. Um, when is the best time to visit Hawk Mountain in the fall? Well, the migration starts in mid-August and goes through mid-December, but there's really three different peaks to the flight. So in mid-September, like between the 10th and the 20th, you will usually get the big surge of broadwing hawks, but it's very hard to predict. And then in early October, we get uh, the occipiters and the kestrels and falcons. And then in November, uh, late October and November, we get the golden eagles and red tails. So there's really three different times to visit. If you can choose your visit day based on weather, not everybody can, but if you can, uh, keep in mind that that cold front is really key. So getting days with a lot of wind are great days at Hawk Mountain. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, have you been able to examine whether wind farms um, on migratory routes that are on migratory routes and be able to provide information on, on stopping or mitigating wind farm problems in migratory areas? You know, that, that is a whole uh, area of study in itself. And we really haven't done research on wind farms. And, uh, but we do know that they kill birds. Um, and some of it can happen very incidentally, like with, mm -hmm. when certain weather conditions occur. So, um, you know, I think our, we have a statement on our website that, that suggests that wind turbines should not be placed within migratory flyways. It just makes sense. Right, right. Um, Let's see, I think we just had a couple more. Lori, how large is a large unbroken forest in um, your view? Oops. Okay. Okay, yeah, um, I would say for raptors, we're looking at, you know, 200 to 1,000 acres at least. It, de it depends on the landscape. When I was tracking our, our birds, um, you could almost predict where they were going to go by looking at a map and looking where the forest patch, the largest patch of woods was close to them. So a lot of them were using the Kittatinny Ridge, which is huge, but some of them were just going down in a patch of woods of 200 acres. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. One last question. Are there any future new technologies you're looking forward to help the science of hawk migration? 
Yes, um, we're going to be trying the new MODIS tags. I don't know if anyone's oh, familiar right. with those, <laughs> the life tags, um, on the American Kestrel. And they're very lightweight, uh, and so they, but they depend on these towers. So, um, so there is that. Um, we're also looking into some other new telemetry uh, possibilities uh, in the future. But we're anxiously awaiting these, these smaller satellite units that uh, mm -hmm. hopefully become available so we can understand um, some of these migration of some of these smaller birds. Great. Okay. Well, I think we, I think we covered all the questions that we had. We, um, people do want to know where do we go to rewatch the presentation. So Jeanette can tell us that, but switching over to <laughs> Bobby, I guess. <laughs> Okay, hi, this is Bobby Asher of the Chicago Audubon Society, and I want to thank Dr. Goodrich for such a terrific presentation uh, and very inspiring. And as you can see, if you can see on the screen all the people clapping, I wish you could hear the applause. Uh, it was really, really enjoyable. I learned a lot, and I'm sure everybody else did as well. So thank you so very much. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you who joined us this evening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, on behalf of our Compelling Voices group, uh, I want to invite all of you to join us for our next uh, presentation, which will be on November 18th. So please uh, mark your calendars. And we are excited to be able to host uh, Audrey Peterman. And uh, she's the co-founder of Earthwise Productions, and she will be talking about the Dr. Bird, uh, which is the national bird of Jamaica, which is where she grew up. And she's also going to talk about how our national parks have inspired her work uh, to connect uh, America's public land systems and the American public. So I'm sure that'll be another terrific presentation. So uh, thank you again, all of you, for joining us. Uh, have a terrific evening, and uh, we'll see you soon. <laughs>